One of the few things religion actually gives to believers is an easy answer to a grieving person. It's not a true answer. It's not a good answer. It's not even a helpful answer, but it's an easier one to articulate than what the answers that a secular person is left with. But just because the question is hard doesn't mean we have to shy away from it. And that's why I'm happy to welcome Carrie Black to the show. She tackled that very question with a book that she co-authored called Sometimes Illness Wins. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, so now I I frame this as sort of an attempt to at a secular answer, the book, but I'll leave the other half of the equation to you. What question is this book answering and who is it for? Mostly it's answering somebody died. Now what? We don't have a good societal level conversation about grieving, especially, like you said, one that is not tied to religion. And there's so many things we just don't have cultural knowledge for. What can I expect to experience now that my Mm -hmm. brain is mildly traumatized and I'm, I'm living through this intense experience that I don't have a guidebook for? And, and who's the intended audience? So adults and children, really anyone who wants a better handle on like what is evidence-based best practice tell us right now for what to expect when grieving. Okay, so and and what I mean, I I've, I've read the book, so I sort of already know the answer to this. But what prompted you to write it? My daughter Addie drew her first recognizable portrait at the age of three. It was a praying mantis. It was serrated four limbs and compound eyes and everything. She wanted to be an illustrator, lived with a pencil case and drawing pad on her person at all times. The line drawing that is on the dedication page is actually hers. That's concept art for a picture book we were working on together when she died. When she died in in 2018, gosh, people tried so hard (laughs) to be helpful. They gave me so many books and none of those books were as helpful as they could have been. Mm -hmm. They were either so generalized as to be useless or so dense as to be incomprehensible, really, to my traumatized, grieving brain. (laughs) During grief, you have this brain that, that can't do so many things. You lose skills and you lose computing power, like all these, these things that happen to your brain. I remember standing in the grocery store looking at the card reader with my credit card in my hand and I couldn't remember how to use it. Wow. Yeah, probably not the time to start digging through a thick tome on what to expect. Yeah, yeah, I guess I can understand that. It, it, thank goodness for the very kind cashier who recognized my distress and ran the card for me. But I had no idea. Like th- nothing, nothing in, in my religious upbringing had prepared me for the kind of experience that was ha- happening, kind of experience I was having. And nothing in my like science education even had covered this or even anything adjacent to it. So like how much information I didn't have was a bit shocking. Mm-hmm. Now, so as... I well know books tend to be a team effort, especially an illustrated book, which I've I've never tried to do something like that. So can you tell us a little bit about your co-collaborators on this? Who who were they and and, and what did they contribute? So Becky, who is co-author with me, has been my friend and neighbor for over 15 years now. (laughs) And she is very conveniently an LCSW, so licensed clinical social worker, as well as a just first rate, outstanding human being. I knew what I wanted to say about grieving and those things that don't get talked about Mm -hmm. enough and like some of the information I wanted people to have access to. And she was there to, you know, make sure it was all research-based and lined up with evidence-based best practice. She also has the clinical experience to make sure that We were including things that mental health professionals really wish people knew. Like, oh, if everyone could come into therapy with an understanding that emotions are signals and not something inherently good or bad, Mm -hmm. that would be amazing. So we have a double page spread about (laughs) emotions being there to tell you that there's something that you need. Right on. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's that's one thing that like I, I think far too few people who are setting out on an effort like this do is is make sure that everything lines up with best practices. So kudos to you for that. Was there any other research that you had to do on, on your way into it? There's a lot, a lot of listing. You know, I had my own experience and I knew what I really wish someone had been able to give me like in book form or advice form or just commiseration. <laughs> but we really wanted it to be very generally applicable. Right. No matter your background and that. So lots of listening to uh, mental health professionals like therapists and psychologists, researchers, and then listening to people who'd lost someone recently or long ago or, you know, somewhere in the middle, listening for those things that only get said in grief groups because society at large doesn't want to do that or deal with that. And then especially those things that only get said in particular grief groups, because even other grievers don't want to hear about things like how your kid was shamed to death by the local culture. Yeah. There's, there's those limits even within populations that are supposed to understand. And I really wanted to get past all of that. There's so much normalization that we need around the grieving process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And kudos to the people who are doing the work to actually change that. Now, of course, I've had some experience uh, with, with writing a book in the past. And I, I feel like you don't, you're not really done with a book until you hate it. A lot of, lot of stuff goes into getting it across the finish line. Was there one thing that stood out to you like as the biggest challenge for you in this? Okay, I, I, I'd be, you know, a bit, um, a bit ridiculous here, but it's also true. And that was reading my drafts after I'd cried on them. Oh, <laughs> I'm, wow. I'm, I'm very much a, a pen and paper author. Like I will stick it in the computer eventually, but all my best work comes the more old fashioned way. So I have these physical copies and it would be a very emotional experience trying to capture the essence of this intense thing people go through. And I just, I would relive it. And so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Lots of salt water. Lots of salt water. (laughs) Yeah. I can only imagine. That that, that is not one of the challenges that like, you know, that I I really had to worry about with Diatribes Volume 2 or anything. (laughs) I'm with you, by the way. Uh, Pen and paper, way to go. Tom from Citation Nita was making fun of me for that the other day. I'm the same way. Oh, (laughs) for shame. Oh, it's very tactily satisfying. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it it forces you to slow down and to think about every single word a little bit more. I don't know. I, 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 or, or I'm just an old guy and I'm used to writing with a pencil. <laughs> Maybe that's it too. <laughs> you find what works for you. Right, right. So within the book, there are a number of times, like you said, there's a lot of lists in the book. And I think that's really good because I think that's exactly the kind of thing, the kind of rote thing that, that you know, I, I, I know I would want in a book like this. But there's a number of spots where you left blanks, right? Like there will be a list of different emotions you might feel. And it ends with a series of blanks. What, what are you communicating with those blank spaces? So there's lots and lots of overarching themes in grieving, like things you can just expect to have happen in some way. But it's also this hyper individual process and and remains so mm-hmm. to an extent that I, I just don't think we're really good at comprehending, especially since we tend to tell only certain stories about grieving, that we lose a lot of that individuality that naturally exists in this space. And I want to present enough options that it makes it really easy to see your own experience clearly. But I also want to normalize all the things that happen when you're grieving. And those things shift so readily. Like if I'm having a really intense grieving day, what my pencil or my brain automatically puts in those blanks can be really different in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And that, that sort of flexibility that we, we need when faced with grief, it's really hard to keep that, which is why we also say in the book, scribble out anything that doesn't apply to you particularly. My extended family was actively harmful before my daughter's death. 
And they weren't any better after she died. If anything, they got worse. You know, in, in my personal copy, the helpers page has a bit of a hole <laughs> where <laughs> I've scribbled out family kind of emphatically. Yeah, there's one of the things that really jumped out on me at me in the book is that there was such an effort to personalize it to, you know, obviously you're, 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 you say you want it to be approachable for everybody, but there was a very like, there almost seemed to be a bit of a back and forth within the book that I thought was really impressive. So obviously, other than pick up a copy of Sometimes Illness Wins, what advice can you give, you know, because like you said, this is a book for adults and for children, but it's, you know, it's in in the form of of sort of a children's book. What advice would you give to parents who might find themselves in a situation or not necessarily parents, just people dealing with a, a kid who suddenly needs to understand grieving? What what advice would you give them just sort of top level? Really big picture stuff. And this might feel like a bit of a cop out, but adults are often explaining death to themselves at the very same time they're trying to help children navigate it, especially their own, their own children. Sometimes learning on the fly is, is really fun and exciting. I, I would suggest that this is not one of those times if you can manage it. And, and I know this is a big ask because society will not support you in this. Learn about grieving now, like before you need it. And if your kids, you know, if, if you're worried particularly about your own children, if your kids are emotionally developed enough, take them along for the ride and say, I don't know, lots. That is probably the best phrase that I ever employed in parenting was, I don't know, let's figure that out. Yeah. Let's go look it up. Awesome. That, no, that's great advice, actually. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I, I want to like sort of veer off script because as we've been talking, this, this question, it just keeps recurring to me. You've mentioned a couple of times that our society is very bad at having conversations about grief and having fulsome conversations, right? Like we have very prescribed, like you're, this is your line, this is my line. Yes. Do you have any, and I know I'm just asking you to wildly speculate here, but do you have any thoughts on why that is, why we're so bad at that conversation? I think, because we're just basically bad at emotions in general. From my own experience, the day my daughter died, I had over a dozen people come to the house and they wanted to comfort me and they wanted to be helpful. I ended up spending more energy on them than they gave it back to me. Right. Because they didn't know what to do with my emotions and, and me being chaotic and, and like unpredictable and all over the place. There was a script that they felt they needed to walk through to comfort themselves. And there wasn't room in that script for my messiness in that moment. Not because they weren't trying, but because they didn't have any practice really with dealing with emotions on that kind of intense level. And that's the thing I would really love to see our society get better at. Great answer. All right, so I saved the most important question for last. Where can our listeners go to pick up a copy of your book? Fillingthegappublishing.com has links to our Square Store and an ebook and a form to fill out if you qualify for the Mental Health Rockstar discount, which applies to anyone who works in mental health or even peripherally, nurses, therapists, teachers, <laughs> nonprofits, after school programs. We, we try and be very generous with that one. And the King's English Bookstore, which is uh, here in Salt Lake with me, if you're outside of the U.S. and you would like a physical copy, they are currently our only way to get you one. Oh, well Many blessings <laughs> on their heads for providing that service for us. Um, yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, well, we'll have all of that linked on the show notes. Of course, if you want to pick a copy, all you'll have to do is go there. Carrie, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us today. And thank you for prompting this conversation. Thank you for being part of the conversation and making a difference. <laughs> 